is at 10 a.m. here in Canada. Um, I welcome you all to the third edition of our Microsecture Exchange seminar series or webinar series. Um, before we start with the presentation, uh, just a few housekeeping items. Um, we do it as last time. Um, the talk will be for roughly 45 minutes. There's going to be two stopping points where Angela will open up for questions. Um, I would encourage you to put the questions into the Q&A, which I'll be monitoring. Um, Angelo's co-author, uh, Fabricius, will also be looking at the Q&A and potentially give you an answer along the way. Um, I will then, at the, at the first, at the two intermittent Q&A stopping points, I will ask the questions, and then at the very end, I will open it up so that anybody can ask their questions in person. Um, now, before we start, uh, just a few more items. You're going to send out our newsletter uh, in a few days, um, or probably later today or tomorrow, where we announce uh, next week's talk, which will be by Marie O'Hara. Uh, there's also two other items of note on there. Um, most of you will be familiar with the Central Bank Microstructure Workshop. Um, the deadline for that one has been extended to May 15, and uh, we include some more information about that one in the newsletter. And then finally, um, when we started the seminar series, we wanted to get it off the ground quickly, and we ran it like a normal seminar where we essentially picked the speakers uh, we thought would be great to have. Um, but we always had the intention to make this open and uh, open to everybody. And um, so in the newsletter, there will be a, uh, a call for uh, proposals, uh, for, not for proposals, there will be a call for submissions um, so that uh, going forward, um, we will have a democratic process in place by which you know, papers that will be presented in this series will be selected. Um, so the call will go out uh, in the newsletter, we'll be going on our website too. Uh, look out for that one. Uh, it has a very short fuse because we assume that most of you have already a few papers ready um, and then we can go from there. Um, and then also some of you, many of you will be contacted uh, and we ask you to be part of the democratic uh, selection process and please look out for that would come in a separate email. All right, but now uh, to the main event. Um, we're very happy to have Angelo Ronaldo here who is going to talk about information risk in FX market. Uh, Angelo, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas. And thanks for the opportunity to present this paper, which is a joint work with Fabricius, uh, uh, so Margie, uh, who is online, can take some questions, and physically is uh, at Stanford University. So I'd, I'd like to motivate the paper by telling you why we should understand better asymmetric information in FX market. Right, I think there are, there are at least three reasons. First, uh, the size. Uh, do not forget that the FX market is the largest financial market in the world with a sheer size of more than $60 trillion of trading volume every day. Second, it's a over-the-counter market and then it features limited transparency, it's highly fragmented, uh, there are uh, heterogeneous market participants, including big FX dealers, more regional banks, corporates, and so on. And everybody potentially possess uh, different information sets that can contribute uh, differently to the FX determination. And finally, there, was, uh, there have been recent structural changes, including regulatory uh, uh, frameworks, but also new technology, for instance, the rise of algorithmic trading. So all in all, uh, all these issues should affect uh, information asymmetry. So against this background, we address the key question, is asymmetric information uh, deep-rooted uh, in the FX market. And if this is the case, the natural next question is, uh, what is the economic value of asymmetric information risk? So the main result uh, that we found are that uh, asymmetric information in the global market is pretty pervasive. Um, there are always uh, category of market participant that is better informed than other. 
and then also asymmetric information um, uh, varies across time and currency pairs. The second main result is that we quantify this asymmetric information risk in a premium. To do that, we propose a new asset pricing factor um, capturing this uh, asymmetric information and selection issues. Okay, how we uh, contribute to the literature? I think we contribute, uh, our contribution is twofold. One on the market microstructure venue, uh, we provide empirical support to the informational models. As the literature started with Gloucester and Midrom and Kyle in 1985. Uh, we provide, and then also extend it, uh, apply to the FX market, and including um, heterogeneous agents like in the bucket of uh, Van Vinkoop and Evans Alliance 06. On the methodological side, we build upon the seminal work of Joel Asbrook uh, that enable us to identify permanent price impact and, and temporary press impact. And what we um, contribute also is the, to the order flow price impact literature, which is not new in the FX market. And here I, I, you can see some papers that already in their prior research. What is new is that we show that there is a heterogeneous uh, order flow price impact at the global uh, level. The contribution to the asset pricing literature is uh, again empirical support to these uh, strand uh, theories uh, like Wang and the, uh, David Heasley a quarter uh, showing that asymmetric information should demand a premium right in particular Garleanu and, and, and Pedersen um, show that uh, asymmetric information risk not only should demand a larger bid spread but also a risk premium and then we, we contribute to the literature uh, in FX asset pricing, where it um, uh, was started with uh, Lucy Verdelan, built a cross section of currency portfolios. Right? In this uh, literature, I would like to emphasize Manco et al, um, uh, who uh, actually uh, uh, got data from um, a given bank about disaggregated order flow of the customer of this bank and they show that the dealers uh, can get some smart money by following uh, customer order flow. And then Gargano et al more recently uh, look at the economic value of FX volumes. Uh, our contribution to this literature is uh, that we are the first pricing asymmetric information risk in the FX market. Okay, so I organized the, the talk uh, as follows. So data, I would like to talk more about the data and method, then um, summarize the main result of the market microstructure side and asset pricing. Before that, uh, maybe uh, it's a good point to take some question, if any. So for now, I see no questions in the Q&A. Um, if anybody wants to quickly uh, put forward a question. Okay, so then let me very briefly just ask, maybe just for further clarification, can you give us some intuition, maybe some explanation of how you envision that uh, asymmetric information would be pervasive, generally speaking, in FX markets? There's, there's a lot of public information. Where would the asymmetric mm -hmm. information come in here? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do that in, in a moment. Um, yeah, the main idea is that it's an over-the-counter market information is dispersed. So in principle, everybody can have uh, different information sets. But before that, let me tell you a bit about the data. So the data comes from uh, CLS, uh, stands for Continuous Linked Settlement. And this entity was uh, founded in 2002 to mitigate settlement risk. Today, CLS operates the largest multi-currency cash settlement system in the world. So actually, it handles more than 50% of the global FX trading volume. So from this uh, data uh, source, we obtain hour by hour order flow for FX spot. 
And moreover, this is disaggregated by customer groups. So on the one side, we have the price taker of the buy side, banks, corporates, funds, non-banks, financial firms. We have also the total volume of them, the total order flow. And we also have the sell side, the market making side uh, in total. Right. Although we are the first academics exploring this uh, fantastic data set, notice that um, uh, upon uh, access to this, everybody can, can get this data with a very short delay, actually, I think about 15 minutes of delay. So I should say that we have just scratched the surface of th this rich data set and information content. I think there are many other uh, application uh, both in the academic and uh, the fraction year side. So more specifically to the data, we analyze uh, 30 currency pairs. And there are more, for instance, the Hungarian florin uh, could be also analyzed, but it joined the CLS system later. So we decided to focus on these 30 currency pairs, including all the major currencies. Um, this overall covers 90% of the global FX volume benchmarked with the BIS triannual survey. The sample period is from 12 to the end of 19. And um, we augment this data set with the Olsen rates, uh, the one minute uh, bid and ask and meet quote from, from Olsen. So now to go back to the, your question, Andres, why we should care about asymmetric information? Why should be there in the first place? Well, FX market is a this, this decentralized network in which um, uh, the network centrality belongs to the dealers that eventually can access superior information by looking at uh, oncoming rates, uh, but also order flow, right? Overall, um, there is not one price at, at, at the moment, uh, every moment, but there are more multiple prices everywhere. So there is an ongoing multiple price discovery process in which uh, eventually every individual investor have uh, private information on the currency value or the flow. Moreover, asymmetric information could be originated from other asset classes and then international investor to transmit this uh, asymmetric information into the uh, FX rate. And prior research also showed that uncertainty, but also asymmetric information, private information um, can come from um, policy decision like monetary fiscal policy decision and the way uh, institution implement that, including central bank interventions. So uh, the, maybe the last point is that there, are, there have been uh, institutional changes like regulatory changes um, try to um, reform the over-the-counter market. And this can also have created more fragmentation in the market. So let me show you uh, uh, some descriptive new stylized fact, if you want, by looking at this global data, all right? So what you can see on the top right uh, and corner here, those are the fund, for instance. And uh, on the left top, on the top left uh, right, you have the corporates, and here you have the banks on the bottom right hand, right? And here, non bank financial. So, what you can see is already the size, which is very different. For instance, uh, the funds trade around 10 times more than corporates right in, in these uh, two uh, figures but half as much as uh, banks do right moreover you also see the uh, intraday patterns of this activity and you can uh, observe two extremes corporate and banks um, corporates concentrate trading during the so-called London hours. So after the European opening up to the US uh, closing, right? Whereas banks stay on around the clock 
even if they decline the activity overnight. So this pattern suggests at least three interesting things, I believe. One, be active all the day long, like banks or more sophisticated agents, you can access superior information. Second, during the London hours, it's more possible to share risk, which is suitable for risk averse agents. And third, there is no evidence that FX dealers completely close down their books overnight, as it was believed in the prior research. Here, another figure uh, shortly to tell you that um, you can also look at how order flow of these categories correlate each other. So you see that corporate here tend to trade in opposite direction of more sophisticated agents like fund or um, non-bank financials. On the other end, uh, more sophisticated traders like fund and non-financials here they tend to trade in the same direction instead. So overall, this gives a flavor that there is some information diversity uh, and dispersion. Okay, now um, I would move to the methodological side. So it's, uh, our model is based on the uh, important work by Joel Asbrook, which is uh, a bivariate vector autoregressive model where in the first equation the endogenous variable is return, in the second equation is the order flow, um, then return denoted by R here is um, explained by past return and um, past and contemporaneous order flow denoted by T. Okay, uh, then Apart from uh, augmenting the, the Asbrook uh, setting with uh, some control variables, including dummy variables uh, detecting seasonalities in the day uh, or uh, the size of the order flow, apart from that, we revisit the Asbrook framework by um, including an important feature, which is the heterogeneity of the, the market participant here captured by C. So we allow the order flow to go decompose into the, these uh, categories of order flow by coming from corporates, fund, non-bank financials, and banks, and banks. Right. This is the, the main innovation in, in the methodological side. And the main result that I have in the appendix, but I can summarize as follow. So the first that Overall, we found that uh, the betas, so the order flow price impact, are positive, uh, typically for banks, fund, and, and non-financials. But, and this is uh, in, in line with the market microstructure theory, right? As, as, we, as we, we expected that order flow has a positive price impact. Instead, it's negative for corporates. At least the contemporaneous price impact of corporates is negative, which is in line with um, the fact that typically corporates trade um, trading is largely uninformative. And also there is a common practice in the effects market where dealers give better quotes or attract order flows to offset um, so they tend to attract non-informative order flow, the one coming from corporates, to offset informative order flows coming from other um, institutions like hedge fund also. Right. So then we uh, found also that return is mean reverting. So the negative uh, deltas in the framework before, which is again totally in line with market microstructure, just mean rever reversion. Um, in line with the, the role model or the inventory um, the risk aversion effect. And finally, we found um, uh, positive deltas, meaning that uh, there is order continuation, order flow continuation in the same direction. So buyer initiated uh, trades are tend to be followed by buyer initiated ones and the other way around. So now, 
let's move to the measurement of asymmetric information, right? So this is important for us. So our appro approach allows us to identify permanent and temporary price impact. So the main idea is that the order flow impounding a lasting price impact should convey superior information about the fundamental currency value, right? So how we, we do that, we follow uh, Asbrook 1988, and then also Richard Payne applied this idea to the FX market. And basically what we do, we estimate these betas, um, the, the coefficient capturing the order flow price impact, right? For, for, every, for every agent category J, a currency per K, we sum up the asymmetric information co coefficient betas here, and we got that. And after that, we compute what we call the average price, uh, permanent price impact across agent uh, that should uh, quantify the superior, systematic superior information, which is the average across C. Right? And this measure, uh, should account for the asymmetric information in the FX market. So let me stress um, a few things. Um, some feature of this uh, setting. First, it captures the long life information content of trade net of liquidity effects, right? By doing that, you can uh, remove the temporary effect and focus on the more lasting permanent effect uh, coming from the order flow. Then is a suitable measure of adverse selection and asymmetric information. And second, the way we model it, uh, it also captures heterogeneity in the private information of, can, uh, of this agent, because we have disaggregated order flow. And finally, it also accounts for a possible feedback trading effect. So the main result we, we found by computing this is that there is strong evidence of asymmetric information dispersion in three respects. First, across traders, and for instance, banks and funds tend to exhibit larger price, permanent price impact. Uh, this uh, dispersion is also across currencies, and this kind of uh, suggests market fragmentation. So in some period, some currencies are more affected by asymmetric information. And finally, it also um, uh, varies across time. And I guess this picture uh, gives you uh, an idea about these uh, three um, issues, right? So uh, there are th those are the main takeaways. Right? I think you can see this is the, the time evolution of this permanent price impact measure, our, uh, alpha, here, across the three categories, uh, the four categories of uh, market participant. And the takeaway here is that there is a systematic time variation, it's pretty clear. And second, the, there is less variation for those uh, agents that have a positive price impact, so some superior information. For instance, here, if you look at the line, marked with these uh, circles here. Those are not corona, coronavirus, those are the, the fund, right? Or uh, the one marked with uh, the squares here, which is the banks. They, they tend to have uh, systematically a positive uh, superior information of, um, in, in, the, in the order flow, right? There is much more variation in the corporates and uh, Frequently is also negative, as I, I, I told you before. So overall, this picture lends itself to be analyzed in the asset pricing setting, as we clearly observe a persistent and systematic variation in some superior information here in the FX market. So maybe we, if there is any question. We have a number of questions. Um... We should start with a question by Pam Moulton. Um, she asks uh, about the uh, nature of information, uh, whether it is mainly about order flows or uh, about fundamental information about FX pairs and the economic fundamentals. That's a very good question. So uh, both. So the superior information 
can belong to the fundamental uh, currency value, but also to the order flow itself, as uh, was theorized in, uh, in prior uh, research. So a dealer, for instance, being in, in the central centrality in the network can also extract information from the order flow of its own customers, even if he himself has no superior information then can trade um, following this uh, uh, superior information from other market participants. So, yeah. So then there are um, a few questions about the, uh, the structure of trading and the market structure, generally speaking, as I understand it. Um, so Andre and uh, I think also Roberto Pasquale both ask, you know, if there's any, any indication of something like quote-driven price discovery in this market, or is this all trade-driven? Uh, that's a very good question. So let me stress that our data is granular, but it's hour by hour. Um, so it's an, an aggregated order flow on an hourly basis, and we cannot distinguish between buyer and uh, seller initiated and limit orders and, and uh, market orders. So it's more a flow uh, on a, on a hour basis. So I cannot go in, in, into that. Sure. So let me let me rephrase the question. So that's that's okay for for your research, but there's a general question: is ah. uh, how does trading an FX market works? I think. Uh, Yes. If I understand these questions correctly. Yes. Uh, so yes, there is the aggressor and non-aggressor. Typically, the aggressor is the customer uh, that initiate the trade um, by contacting a, a dealer, which is the market maker. That's the usual way um, it work. Then there are various segments in the market. So this is the customer to dealer segment, the, the, the natural over-the-counter segment. But there is also an inter-dealer segment where typically dealers try to offset the inventory imbalances or eventually the risk to trade against superior, um, superior uh, against a um, agent with superior information in the inter-dealer inter framework. In my past uh, research, I worked also in the inter-dealer segment by using EBS data. But the beauty of this new data set from CLS is that it's, it's global. It captured the global FX market, and we are the first academics um, that have the privilege to, to, to use that, but there is much more to learn about that. Um, then, so, uh, you know, so since we are at, this, at the market structure level, just very briefly, there's a question by uh, Pankai Jain, um, which um, asks essentially has automated have automated trading platforms improved their transparency and maybe there's also a question of what is the extent of the use of these automated trading platforms mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's it's there is no uh, you know uh, clear uh, figures about that uh, it, it would be it's capturing our data set but it's not we cannot have a dedicated category for them uh, the bis um, uh, uh, works, uh, research, uh, stress that this, this is, this, there is a rising, um, there is an increasing share of this algorithmic trading. I have uh, another paper with um, Francis Breedon, uh, Louisa Chen, and um, uh, that we done uh, in the Bank of England with uh, Nick Vause. Uh, we look. We we had the EBS data with the flag. It was a machine, an algo behind that or not. But then again, it's a, a given uh, trading platform. There is no data about the global activity of, of this uh, algorithmic trading. So can you just very briefly, because it fits in here, there's a question by Xiao Zhu. Um, Talk a little bit about the who is in the respective um, in the respective um, cat category. So, for instance, do we have something like who's in the non-bank category? Mm -hmm. Where would central banks fit in if they actually are involved at all in these yeah. trades? That's a very good question. So we have we, we have a, a long explanation about this in, in the paper. So those are uh, of course broad broad very broad categories. For instance, in non-financials, there could be 
institutional insurances, but also hedge funds in, in, uh, in non-banks financial firms. Um, banks are really banks, so the CLS can, can see them and, and, and know who they are. And typically there are you know, uh, members of the CLS system. Then corporates, um, there should be there should a little bias in our data because they should be more large corporates, right? A small corporate typically pass through a bank, uh, and then uh, they would be reported as a as a bank or order flow ultimately, right? So those are the the categories that the way they are structured. Okay, so then I'm going to have one last question where I'm going to merge a question by Corey and by Gideon. And this is again about, um, you know, the interpretation of price impacts, generally speaking. So Corey asks about whether permanent price impact could be explained by price pressures. So for instance, consuming scarce resor um, uh, resources on balance sheets and so on and so forth by the dealers, rather than fundamental information. And then Gideon asks a question, which I understand goes somewhat in the same direction and says, Essentially, if the information is about customer needs and these needs are relating to hedging business operations, so this would be corporates or hedging currency for fixed income and equity instruments, which are the funds, then these should cause a temporary price impact, not a permanent one. So conceptually, it seems to me, citing him directly, uh, that if you identify a permanent price impact, it should be about information that is not about transitory supply and demand. Yes but rather information or fundamental valuation of the currency. Yes, that's totally, totally true. So the beauty of this framework is that can uh, disentangle between trade related and trade unrelated components in the price discovery process. And then the residuals uh, in this framework are mini meaningful interpretation, right? The, the residual in the first equation would capture the unexpected public information or the public information innovations and the residual in the second equation is more about the private information innovation. And now the, the beauty of this setting is that it can capture the innovation that have a, a lasting or permanent impact uh, and the economic interpretation of that is private information about the fundamental value. Okay, so I think we should move on. I'm going to uh, leave myself again and um, we're looking forward to the next segment of Q&A. Cool, thank you very much for your question. Um, now, uh, yeah, let's go back to the, the, the intuition here. Um, the, so I, I think uh, there is compelling evidence that it, there is this asymmetric information in the FX market, at least uh, according to our results. Now, a rational agent should demand a premium for holding currencies with higher asymmetric information because he or she is taking the risk of trading against informed traders, right? That's the main intuition um, that motivate our asset pricing analysis. So empirically, then currency pairs with a large permanent price impact should provide an higher expected return and the other way around, currency pairs with a small or any no, nothing, right? Permanent price impact should provide no additional excess expected return. So that's the, the main intuition. And then we um, implement this idea in a very simple way. So what we do, we essentially construct portfolio-based risk factor. What is that? It's a self-financing equally weighted long short portfolio. So we rebalance every month um, uh, this portfolio and we take into account transaction costs by, by considering bid and ask uh, uh, rates, right? So let me tell you a few more things about this. Um, how we generate, we produce the signal, right? So we estimate our main uh, uh, regression. So equation one, I told you before, how we do that where we, we estimate uh, in a one year rolling over manner, a daily, a daily frequency, this uh, estimate, this coefficient, and then we extract the permanent price impact or alpha 
um, based on that. And finally, we sort uh, systematic price impact uh, across currency pairs. And we do that using the, the past, the yesterday trading signal to create today's uh, portfolio weights, right? So that's the way we, we work. And then to compute re excess return, we just follow you know, the literature. As standard in the literature, we compute the net log excess return by going long in the FX currency X here uh, and a short key order. So that the spot and the forward, and we take into account the bid and the ask for the transaction cost. That's pretty standard in literature. So now uh, about the main result, and let me use gross return. Uh, this table shows you the annualized uh, sharp ratio, the, then the mean excess return, the maximum drawdown, and other measure like the Q performance measure of Gertzman and so on, right? So here on the right hand side, you, you, you see uh, the, the return, the performance uh, of the linear combination of Q1, which is the portfolio sh uh, shorting the non-informative currencies uh, against the Q3, which is the one with informative, uh, um, with the informative uh, currency values, right? And what you can see is that um, the performance is uh, significant, statistically not only, but also economic, economically, right? And then to compare that with the um, existing uh, uh, risk factors in the literature, you, you should see them in the left hand side, right? Uh, you clearly see that uh, the common effects of factor strategies studied in the prior uh, uh, literature uh, perform less well than uh, this uh, asymmetric information. Um, a portfolio HML that we we propose. So that's the main takeaway. I would like just to stress this BMS here. What is that? Well, the BMS would be a portfolio based on the total order flow, right? And it's more in the spirit of Manco Fetal, the JF the 16 paper, where they um, take the point of view of a dealer following smart money from the customer. So looking at the, the, the oncoming order flow from the customer and form portfolio based on that. So this BMS um, take the whole order flow. So that do not, does not distinguish between, you know, the temporary uh, permanent price impact. So do not disentangle the informative and non-informative parts in the order flow. And of course it performed um, as a positive performance, but not that well as the, the AIP then. But to me, this is uh, natural because here we capture better um, the, the informative part in the order flow, the one that is supposed to have a, a, a persistent impact. Okay, now um, these figures, um, the, the one on the top, I'm gonna focus only on that, uh, depicts the cumulative return of the different uh, rebalancing frequency um, prior to the transaction cost. In the appendix, you can find the one after transaction cost. So for uh, uh, monthly, weekly, and daily. And what you can see is that, um, this uh, performance, the equity curve steadily increase over time and do not experience really any regime changes or switches, right? So that's, that's clear, pretty, well, even in the, in the recent period, you see um, an increasing performance. S second, um, uh, after transaction cost, of course, the daily rebalancing suffer. Uh, uh, by by the the transaction cost, but the monthly one remain essentially the, the same. Okay, now um, on this slide, uh, I'll show you the exposure regression based on the monthly gross excess return. Um, what we do that we we uh, regress 
uh, this excess return from our uh, portfolio strategy on uh, the other uh, portfolio based factors in the literature and what you can see is that any of them can explain um, our factor return um, the one that have a significant connection with that are uh, the re uh, real exchange rate portfolio and the uh, the, um, the carry right and this could be um, intuitive because after all the rare it's a portfolio based strategy based on fundamental information and it makes totally sense to me that the, this correlate with our um, portfolio based also in, on uh, uh, superior information. Uh, maybe another message from this table is that um, if you combine existing portfolio based strategy with our strategy, you would have a nice diversification effect because they are pretty different. Okay, now um, as a final step, I would like to talk uh, just a little moment about the possible economic drivers of this asymmetric information uh, risk measure. So if we regress our return on a broad measures, then can eventually covariate with asymmetric information, we found this. So we found that uh, overall, uh, our measure tend to increase with, for instance, VIX increases. So in times, in bad times, in times of uncertainty and global uh, investor fears, uh, asymmetric information risk increases, right? And maybe, and also does as, as well with, uh, you know, credit default risk uh, spread increases. And, and, um, I would like to tell you about these top FX dealers. This is a measure that essentially is the following. If you take the price of equity shares of the big FX global dealers and you form, you compute a portfolio return of them, right? We get um, a measure of the financial health and the funding uh, uh, condition of these FX big uh, global dealers, right? We, I already used this measure uh, in my paper with Nina. Um, I think uh, it's a crude measure, but it captures a bit how in good health are the FX dealers, right? And as you can see, when um, the, the uh, funding condition and equity capital deteriorate, Right, they the they tend to um, uh, asymmetric information risk is larger, which is uh, in line with the you know modeling of uh, Gabe Majori or the new asset pricing literature that I have in mind the intermediary asset pricing literature, for instance the Krishnamurti, in which you know there is a, a, a kernel. Uh, uh, dedicated to these global dealers, then when there are constraints, um, they tend to pull back, uh, provide less liquidity, but also charge risk premium to the customer, uh, to their customers, right? So I think this is consistent with, with this idea. Okay, we also perform a, a you know, robust and check uh, a lot. Uh, so we have a, you can find them in our 87 uh, page online appendix. So if you are sleepless, uh, go there. Um, so we perform rolling uh, different, you know, uh, investment period, uh, sub, sub sampling analysis, not only US dollar based, Euro and so on. Um, maybe I would like to stress the risk aversion issue. Why? Because risk aversion, in theory, um, increases the price impact. Um, and you can see that in a very nice uh, paper in Subranamian 91 RFS, but also in Kyle 89, right? 
where a risk averse agent that could be either uh, market makers but also uh, informed traders when they are risk averse the price impact increases so then um, what we do is to uh, check if uh, uh, in times or in currencies or in period of, uh, of uh, higher risk aversion um, we do find uh, the same uh, picture and uh, overall we found that um, uh, the similar result for instance when we restrict the order flow only during the main trading hours the london hours in which it's uh, better to share risk and should attract also less risk averse uh, more risk averse uh, investors and also when we control our result for time varying risk aversion here we used the method uh, proposing the JME, JME paper by Becker the quarter, um, we found um, that uh, you know the, the qualitative the same result. Okay, I think it's time to wrap up. Um, yes, so uh, we find that asymmetric information risk is being uh, deep rooted across market participants, the time and the currency pairs, being a systematic factor asymmetric information risk uh, should demand a premium and this is what we found in our results well thank you very much Angelo. this is great um i think we're now at the point in time where we can uh, open it up for raising hands in q a um, so i should be able to see it if people have raised their hands um, there are two outstanding questions that have been received some high upvotes oh okay um before I um, let the first person speak, uh, let me just quickly ask uh, two questions which came from the Q&A. Uh, the first one is from uh, Baba Rindi. She asked whether or not the one hour time window that you choose is adequate to measure the price impact for very liquid instruments. Yes, the, this is a fair question. Um, look, I know that uh, for market microstructure uh, experts like uh, we are or you are um, one hour could be a long time period that's true uh, on the other end uh, you also have you know papers using daily uh, order flows uh, yes um, eventually it's possible i think with the new data set to go to a more high frequency um, uh, the, the only thing that we need to keep in mind if you go at least using CLS data at very high frequency, you need to be careful because those are settlement uh, data. Um, uh, FX uh, uh, rates are um, transaction are typically settled within a few minutes, typically two, three minutes, but it could be that some of them uh, are settled with a some delay. So I think one hour uh, put us in the conservative side uh, uh, in that sense, because we are pretty sure that the, the, the hour by hour volume capture the real activity. Okay, so the next question comes from Chester. Who has to unmute no, himself? No, 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 that must've been a mistake, sorry. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so, okay, so then uh, let me ask uh, a question. Um, so, Marius asked a question. Uh, he, can, he asked, can we distinguish between the role of, um, oh, that's not the one, that's the question. Where did it go? Uh, so, as I think you may have answered this in your robustness checks, but he asked, uh, let me just ask it all the same. Um, can we distinguish between the role of overnight and regular London hours markets? Um, so, you know, to what extent are the, the price impact questions driven by, uh, you know, the, uh, the overnight inventory concerns? Yes, that's a very good question. I, I think you can see my screen, right, my slides. Yes, in the appendix you can see, so if you um, uh, focus on uh, the, the various hours, uh, intraday periods, right, that's the what you would uh, see as a performance or asymmetric information portfolio HML. 
right? Uh, I think to answer this question, you see that if you are more in the in liquid hours, uh, you you see uh, the same positive return, but less strong than the one uh, during the informative intraday periods, right? Overall, you find a consistent picture, but yes, um, it, it would be it would be different here instead. Uh, uh, the roll, roll, uh, cumulative uh, roll, rolling growth return. Um, uh, and this is uh, also, you know, the composition of the portfolio uh, originated from the, the currency pair. So you see overall uh, that there is no a dominating currency pair um, and there is no dominating agent. Uh, uh, who is uh, always more informed than the other, right? Here, uh, the black bars, this, these bars represent the, the categories of market participant and how they fit, they, how they contribute to the, to the short and long, the long uh, leg and the short leg in the, in the portfolio. So overall, there is dispersion in the superior information. Every market participant, uh, contribute to that. I think banks more and sophisticated agent more than other, but there is variation in it. Okay, um, the next person I would like to talk is, is Abi. Yes, thank you. Uh, do you have an assessment? How much does it affect uh, on, the, on the value of the currency? If you take uh, a currency for I think you cut out the Abi. Because you talked about, about return, mm -hmm. but you can, but you can convert, uh, look at in terms of values. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure about that. So what we estimated is the order flow uh, impact, right, by categories and so, but about the economic value, uh, I need to think about that. I'm not sure if I, I got your question. I mean, you talk. I mean, you talk about excess return of 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 currencies versus another versus other other currency. Mm -hmm. So these excess returns should be should be converted to values. I mean, if you look at equities, mm -hmm. you know, for example, a Mude Mendelssohn story. So if mm -hmm. you look about uh, about um, a stock that that required excess return. This has adverse adverse effect on its value. Mm -hmm. well, maybe I got it now. Yeah. So currencies currency pairs are value per value. The difference is that. So if it's intuitive in equity market, right? When you sell, you want to get rid of the equity and get cash, and cash is king, right? Here are two uh, caches denominated in different uh, currencies, right? So it's not clear where you want to go. So if one of them, it's a safe uh, even currency, of course, uh, could play the role of, of the cash and of the safe side of, of the position. So uh, in that sense, yeah, you can, you can convert maybe in a base currency like the dollar and see and see and, and then quantify uh, this value. I guess this it could be your. Yes, this is this this is what I mean. But yeah, do you have an assessment for that? Yes. Uh, no, but I'm gonna think about that. Thanks, Abi. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So next one is uh, Cameron. Uh, hi there. Um, so do you have? Um, I think it's Table Twelve on the uh, in the paper, which is the cumulative rolling growth returns. Um, 
Find the fib, okay. Um, or sorry, figure, figure 12, sorry. Um, so it looks like when you look at kind of the portfolio returns here, like it looks like maybe there's a, like um, eventually your portfolio returns like start to reverse or revert at the end of mm -hmm. know, maybe 38 months. Mm -hmm. um, so is there like this like reversal in this um, AIP portfolio? Um, and at kind of what horizon does that occur? Uh, so, um, we, our benchmark uh, unit of time is months, the months. Uh, I think we also tried quarterly and we found a similar picture, but then, you know, we, we, we have fewer observations. Um, but it's a good question. Uh, I don't think, I mean, by construction, this model should capture more the lasting impact. Uh, in that sense, it should remain there. Okay. Thank you. So next person is uh, Martin Richter, please. Yes, okay. thank you. I would like, I would like to ask uh, about central banks. It has been already been asked a little bit. If you look at some currency pair like your Swiss or the Hong Kong dollar, do you have different behaviors, uh, especially, I mean, from 2012 to 2015, maybe your Swiss is a little bit the same now. It's also the Hong Kong dollar about the, the information you see in these currency pairs. Uh, that's a, a, a great question. Um, Look, uh, so we just run a robust check. For instance, we remove the Swiss, the Swiss, or we remove the, the fixed, um, the packed uh, currencies and so on, and we found uh, the same, res similar results, right? Now, to, to, in another paper with Paolo, uh, that we look at the volume, tra FCLS trading volume. We also have a, a section about central bank um, actions. In particular, we have in mind when the Swiss National Bank removed the peg in uh, 2015, 15 January, right? And we look at how this uh, affected the, the trading activity in terms of volume, realized volatility, uh, and arbitrage condition. So, there you can find more about, about this uh, important event. But here we just run some robust and check excluding uh, currencies that possibly are affected by uh, central bank intervention. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, then let me, um, nobody has, uh, Liz has their hands raised, but let me ask some questions then from the chat. So some people still keep contributing questions to the chat. Feel free to raise your hand and ask them in person. Um, so um, there are, the, the currency pairs must be different. So this is for, uh, what I wanted to ask earlier for Marius. Um, and uh, it seems to be that pairs uh, should, some of them are less liquid than others. So there are fewer or more counterparties. And so how do you know that you don't capture non-informational drivers of liquidity that way? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, so, uh, first, let me repeat, this, this methodolo methodology uh, account for that. It's the, I think, the most suitable setting to disentangle temporary effect, non-informative effect, non-informative frictions uh, from the one that are more informative, the informative um, a component of the order flow. That's on, on the method. On, on the currency pairs, you, we, we actually look at that and we have found that regardless the liquidity level of the currency pairs, there is always, uh, you know, uh, this uh, measure of asymmetric information is always significant, right? Um, so there is no um, concentration of this effect in, in liquid currencies, in liquid period, uh, or more in liquid uh, or less active um, market participant. So this is why we stress is a pervasive uh, phenomenon 
in the FX market. All right, next question comes from uh, Corey Garriott from the Bank of Canada. Hello, uh, thanks for this great paper. I just had a little suggestion on the permanent price impact bit. Uh, one thing you could do to distinguish between the inventory hypothesis, which can explain permanent price impact, and the asymmetric information hypothesis, which also can, is if you take advantage of your counterparty type data, you could compute the recently built inventory position of the sales side uh, mm -hmm. counterparty type and use that information to distinguish between uh, permanent price impacts explainable by inventory buildup and, and uh, just price pressure mm -hmm. and permanent price impact due to asymmetric information. And it seems like that might be important because in a lot of markets, uh, dealer balance sheet capacity is scarce. So that can, that can explain a lot. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Actually conditioning on the inventory, the really recent past inventory position could be a, a nice idea. Um, on the other end, again, the method uh, should enable us to um, disentangle temporary effect, mean reverting effect, stationary effect, like uh, the inventory effect or the order handling cost, and from those that are a permanent effect, which is the informative one. But I think it's an excellent idea. Uh, it would be also nice to uh, carry out research that try also to see if inventory imbalances also demand a risk premium. Our first uh, attempt was about information, about uh, superior information, asymmetric information, because that's the one that should remain in, in the in the price in the asset pricing, and therefore it's a more natural demand of a risk premium. But I, I think it's an excellent idea to uh, uh, look into the inventory imbalance risk and eventually an asset that um, is more prone to this inventory imbalance uh, portfolio, um, uh, portfolio or, or, or holding risk um, should also demand a premium. Okay, so we're now at uh, 11.02. Um, the official part of the uh, webinar is over and we're going to stop the recording. Angelo has agreed to hang out here for a little longer if there's any more questions and if people would like to get their address, questions addressed. Uh, before, before we completely conclude, I would like to just uh, highlight again, next week we have uh, Maureen O'Hara who will give a presentation on the electronic evolution of corporate bond dealers. And uh, then just a quick reminder again, we're going to send out the uh, call for submissions for future presentations um, you know, for the time of July and so on and so forth over the next few days. Please look out for that and we're looking forward to seeing your papers. Again, and I would like to thank Angelo, Ronaldo, you know, for, for doing this presentation. This is great and we really appreciate you stepping up. Thank you very much. All right.